when when she was elected to Congress, you know, what what were some of the things that she was prioritizing and championing uh, in her first, what, two terms before she announced her, her presidential run in, in 72? Yeah, yeah. She was about halfway through her term, her second term when she announced. And um, it's interesting when she got to Congress, she said, well, I thought, you know, as a as a first term legislator, I'm not going to have that much power. I'm going to try to get resources as much as possible for my constituents. And, you know, and I'm going to try to uh, support um, you know, the, the policies that I think are important. She pretty quickly became known as an outspoken um, critic of the status quo. And as such, she got more, um, she got more ambitious. But the other thing was that, you know, she was really talented as a legislative thinker. Um, she would study, she was a good student. She'd always, you know, she was a teacher and she was a very good student and she would study the legislation. She had really sharp staffers who, you know, would, would go over the substance of legislation. So she understood it as well as or better than anyone else. And so she had become known as a really valuable asset um, on the committee she was on. And in 1971, she was on education and labor. That was the committee that she had most wanted to be on. There's a whole thing about that she was on a different committee and put up a fight about it. But um, as a member of that committee, she became very close or uh, had a good relationship with Carl Perkins, who was the chair of that committee. Now, Carl Perkins is a white guy from Kentucky, which is where I sit right now. And Car Carl Perkins, he was a Democrat. He recognized that she was advocating for a lot of the things that poor people in Kentucky needed also. Not only that, but that she she was such a good student of the legislate of the legislation that she could figure out all sorts of nuts and bolts in that legislation. And so um, in 71, um, she put forward with Bella Abzug, this is, I'm coming back to the feminists, she, uh, with, with her colleague from Manhattan, Bella Abzug, who was a famous feminist. They put together legislation to, uh, start universal child care in the United States. It got through both houses of Congress. It got through the conference committee, which she chaired. It got to President Nixon's desk and he vetoed it on the grounds that it was, you know, too, it was radical social legislation. Um, and then there was not a veto proof majority. So right. that, was, that was that, but I mean, I love, it sometimes staggers me. Like, imagine if universal child care had been instituted in the United States in 1971. It's it incredible. Kind of yeah, yeah. How, how old <laughs> these fights are. I mean, the fight for, for universal health care also, you know, century old. It's just, you know, how, how difficult these things are to, to get past. It's, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Th it's astounding. Um, I mean, so let's talk then about her, her presidential run, uh, which is so central to, to her story. I mean, she only had $300,000 in her campaign fund. Uh, she was yeah. undercut at every step of the way. And yet the impact of that is uh, it, it, it needs to be emphasized for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 50,000 of that 250 was uh, hers. She put it on her American Express card. Wow. So <laughs> you know, it was not it was not a lot of money. But um, yeah, so she she declared for president. She was thinking about it not long after that um, experience of trying to get the child uh, development comprehensive child development act through um, with Bella Absog. And then um in August of 71, she was thinking about a run and she explored it all fall. And then she announced in January. Uh, and the thing is she ran, she's focused on certain States, but she ran a national campaign and she ran to win. She, she did not expect to win. And this is an important distinction because at the time people thought she was crazy. Like she, she can't win. She's just this Congresswoman from Brooklyn. She's black. She's a woman. 
um, her politics or, you know, too far left. What you, she, like, she's crazy. She's crazy. She can't win. She, she understood that that was very unlikely, but her whole point was to create this, like this, uh, this coalition that she was trying to bring together people from the black freedom struggle, people from the feminist movement, anti-war activists. She was pretty outspoken against the Vietnam war, um, poor people in general, um, the uh, brown folks, uh, uh, kids. She was trying to pull the people together who really had historically been disempowered. And she had this vision of democracy that all those people were going to collaborate with their forces and try to advocate for a greater political distribution of power. And that was going to happen through the presidential nomination pro process. And at the Democratic National Convention, um, this was going to put pressure on the platform and put pressure on the eventual nominee. So that was the point. Um, unfortunately for her, the coalition just never did really gel the way that she wanted it to. And that was, she, she, she really regretted that about the campaign. She was so hopeful and her hopes were really dashed that the coalition couldn't come together. But that said, you know, she got this group of folks into politics who were energized by politics in a way that they never had been before. And this is right around, this is the same time that the voting age was reduced to 18. And the people who had heretofore felt disaffected got involved. And some of those folks stayed in politics for the rest of their lives. So it's a really remarkable impact that she had as a, a direct and indirect mentor to these folks. And that coalition building, it's also a model um, that, you know, was thwarted unfairly, yes. But it's also a model to think about is how do we put a, a very vastly different group of people together and hold this group together long enough to sort of have create solid change and I mean, it's hard. If you look at the Democratic Party coalition right now, whoo wee, what a mess. I mean, it's, you know, well, people... it's, it's designed to appeal to like suburban affluent voters as opposed to this more, you know, like a uh, the more rainbow yeah. coalition kind of model. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, but without the rainbow coalition, what happens to the Democratic Party? Right, exactly. Um, so j really quickly, lastly, because uh, uh, we uh, I think we have to wrap here. But um, how, how did she what, what was her relationship like with white feminists, uh, at, at, as I alluded to earlier? Oh, and yeah. Yes, how did they nice. support or her or not so much her, her efforts, uh, pr particularly in the presidential race? Yeah, this is what academics do. We go off on tangents. So it <laughs> okay. was it was a, it was uneasy because at that at that Democratic National Convention, she's in a room with the Women's Caucus and everybody's clapping for her. Everyone's going crazy for her. And a bystander who's standing there clapping tells a reporter, well, you know, I really love her. She's the best one. But I'm clapping out the guilt because I can't vote for her. She's not going to win. And Gloria Steinem, who you asked about before, was personally knew George McGovern and um, and had worked with him already, um, eventually came out for McGovern. Um, but Chisholm lamented the fact that Bella Abzug, who she worked so hard with on that 1971 legislation, that that Bella Abzug would not endorse her. And she um, and she was hurt. Um, she was hurt by Steinem's. Uh, uh, lack of, of, of affirmative support as well. So it was very uneasy. And after that, her relationship with white feminists was never the same again. Uh, she was a co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus. She stopped going to the meeting. She would send an aide. Um, and so it was a, it was a, there was love lost. That makes sense. Um, and those, those fault lines, unfortunately, still uh, remain in, in many instances to this day. Um, but lots to be learned uh, from from Shirley Chisholm's uh, life here. I would uh, highly recommend the book Shirley Chisholm, Champion of Black Feminist Power Politics. Uh, Anastasia Kerwood, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's been great to be here. It's a it's a pleasure. Thanks so much.